Hello and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing what does the future hold for Egypt as we approach the first anniversary since the multi-party presidential elections that saw the Muslim Brotherhood candidate Mohamed Morsi win the presidency in Egypt. We'll be assessing his uh, presidency and his leadership to assess whether things have got better or have things got worse in Egypt and I'm joined by my special guest today is a professor and author from Egypt, Tariq Hegi. Uh, Tariq, uh, welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. It's been about two years since you were last on discussing the um, revolution that occurred uh, back in February I'm of very 2011. very happy to be here. So it's good to have you on the programme again. Um, can you share with our viewers again something about your background, about um, growing up in Egypt and how you've since become one of the kind of liberal and leading lights in Egypt? I was graduated from Enshams University with a degree in law in 1971. Since that time, which is a very long time, I have been living with two hats, the hat of an oil executive and the hat of the academician. The first one took me to Morocco, where I taught at the University of Fas, and then I joined one of the major oil companies, and this is the other hat, and I was the chief executive of this major oil company, Shell, in the Middle East for eight years from 1988 to 1996. 1996, I returned back to academia, where I focused on writing and mainly serving one single purpose, which is modernization of Egypt, modernity. And modernity will immediately bring me to be face to face with political Islam and the Muslim Brothers, because in my view, they are the number one opponent to my project. No, it's very interesting. So um, Egypt now, it's uh, been almost uh, two and a half years since the uh, revolution in Egypt, um, in which we saw the downfall of uh, President uh, Mubarak. And since then, we've had a multi-party uh, party elections, both for the presidency and for the uh, parliament. How do you believe that, is, uh, that Egypt has changed over that time? Apart from any ideological disagreements between me and the Muslim Brothers, fact of life, the Muslim Brothers came to power on the 1st of July 2012, and they have been doing one thing since that time, putting Muslim Brothers in all positions. And they are actually honest to their plan. Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the organization, said, that once the Muslim Brothers come to power, they have to do what he called it, ikhwanization, or in, in English would be Islamization, or I would describe it as radicalization of Egypt. So what they have been doing is putting, Egypt is a large country, country that will be 100 million people in a few years' time. So what they are doing now is putting more Muslim Brothers as all the ministers, the governors, heads of universities, heads of banks, heads of uh, official newspapers and it's very clear why so in order that they kill completely the chance of power rotation next time they will have the elections with every single influential civil servant from their side so the only thing we saw since they came to power a year ago is more Muslim brothers in, in senior positions the big drama was last week when Morsi appointed a governor to Luxor where great portion of the world heritage is located somebody who was a terrorist in some operations against the tourists in the 1997 and 98 the man who's having clashing cough shooting at tourists in the king uh, in, in the valley of the kings in 1979 is today the governor of uh, luxor and if afterwards people say there is a significant drop in the revenues of tourism it is natural. 
Absolutely, which is also um, incredibly shocking. So, how has uh, if we if we look back over the uh, past year, in which uh, um, the Egyptian president uh, Mohamed Morsi, representing the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, has fared? How would you say his uh, presidency has gone so far, and what are the type of policies that he's implemented um, internally in Egypt? Because of the spread of fear that this will be uh, uh, another Afghanistan. What happened that shrinkage in the income of tourism and in many other areas of economic uh, activities. The end result of this, that the rating of Egypt moved from A to B to C, and today it is triple C. Anything after triple C means bankrupt, means Greece. So Egypt now on the edge of being a copy of Greece. If, if the rating goes from triple C to D, it means that advice from the international financial corporations to the world, don't deal with this country, don't lend them money, don't go and have business projects there because it is dangerous. So this is what we achieved after one year with Morsi. Second thing is human rights. We have uh, a backward march in areas like the legal treatment of women, the situation of, of, of the Christians in the country, and it is an outcome of being busy with recruiting more Muslim brothers in positions. This is the only thing Morsi has been doing. The, income, the, the whole economic situation is gloomy because he is not thinking of this. He, he, I don't think that the Muslim brothers aim at that. What they aim at is to make certain that Egypt, the largest Arabic-speaking country, will be always ruled by Islamists. And they are doing their best to guarantee this. And let us think of the economic sphere later on. But there will be no later on. Because in my personal views, you, Islamic governments lack competence. And they need external financing. The, the external financing to government as such come from one or two countries only. Saudi Arabia for the Sunni movements and Iran for the Shiite movements. So can Egypt live all of its life on aid from, from outside? Of course not. You can't do this. You can do it for a small country of 10 million people, but not for 90 million people. So I believe that this year give us the evidence that these people are ideological people in the time of no ideology. Nobody today works on ideology. You have either a good management or a bad management, a modern management or a poor management. But there is nothing called Jewish management, Christian management, Muslim management. There is nothing as such. The, the era of ideology is behind us. And, and, and the, main, the main difference between what's going on in Egypt and a place like Europe is that while religion is protected and, and, and respected in Europe, but respected as religion, you don't use it to govern people. But in, in our case, religion is being used to govern the masses. Yeah. Uh, and why should the uh, West, why should Britain and, and Europe be concerned about the influence the Muslim Brotherhood are having on um, Egyptian domestic politics? There is no now uh, difference between what happens in a country and the rest of the world. You have... Uh, backward educational system in Pakistan, you get it reflected on you here in London. The same in Nigeria. You get a boy from Nigeria that will go in the street and kill an innocent British officer because of the poor education he received and the hatred injected into his heart. So Egypt is the number one Arabic speaking country. It has a great influence on the neighboring countries but also on, on the entire world. If, if Egypt becomes another Afghanistan, it's a liability to everywhere in the world and to this world, which has large number of immigrants. I mean, today, Europe has a problem with immigration. Do you want people to come here to help in your campaign of building a better future or to say this is a wrong path and we will do our best to change it? Some people come here and I wonder why they come here. I mean, do, do you come to Sweden and Norway to change or to join? If you are here to change, you will not do it, by the way. I mean, everything says that science will prevail at the end. Ignorance will lose. But the price is enormous. 
And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that uh, looks at the uh, history of the Muslim Brotherhood, also identifies who the Muslim Brotherhood are. When you walked into the convention center, they had these big banners, and it said, death to Israel, death to America. One of the, the people who were working with me said, you know what, Bob, these people are Muslim Brotherhood. I said, what's that? The Muslim Brotherhood started in 1928 by the founder, Imam Hassan al-Banna. The Muslim Brotherhood had twin strategies. The first strategy is its public face, which is a political organization with charitable organizations. But the core of the organization and the master plan of the organization is a sense of world domination. Their ambition is limitless. منهم من ذهب إلى أوروبا ومنهم من ذهب إلى أمريكا وبدأوا يؤسسون عملا إسلاميا خافت الصوت في أول الأمر واستمروا يعملون فكان ما نرى في الغرب في حداث الطلب المسلمين Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, Tariq, uh, we, we saw in that clip the um, history and the political and religious ideology of the uh, Muslim Brotherhoods. And, and what surprises me the most is when we see the mainstream media coverage of Egypt, and particularly last year's presidential elections, um, that there's been no analysis on the ideology and the religious beliefs of the Muslim Brotherhood. Why do you think this is the case? I'm equally astonished. Since 1928, the year the Muslim Brotherhood organization was founded by Hassan al-Banna, the objectives have never changed. To, and, and people should remember that 1928 means five years only after the end of Ottoman Empire and the Caliphate system in, 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 in Istanbul. This was the reaction to the end of the Ottoman Empire. Somebody came in 1928 and said, Muslims have to work again on establishing the Islamic State, which is the Caliphate system. Since that time, the objectives have been the following. Global domination to one Muslim state covering and including all Muslim population, cancelling the application of modern legal systems, replace them by Sharia law, and of course, when Israel was incepted in 1948, they were the first to cross the border and go to do jihad against the classical enemy of most of the Islamists is, is anything Jewish. Yeah? 
So I don't know why the, why Europe in general and America in particular believe that the Muslim Brothers in Egypt are moderate political movement. Nothing has changed. Their views on women, on Christians, on Jews, on modern state, on secular government, on everything is the same. And the whole thing is they sell good words to the West that we have changed and we will be moderate and the, I mean, let us take their views on Israel. They will never accept that Israel has the full right to, to exist. Let us take their views on Christians in Egypt. They will never accept that this country might be headed by a non-Muslim one day. They are trying to return backward the, the family law provisions. So I am astonished why, if somebody says, but they are moderate compared to Osama bin Laden, everybody is moderate compared to Osama bin Laden. It depends on the benchmark. What is the benchmark we use? And by the way, I've been writing on this, the benchmark for a year now. I say, instead of saying moderate or otherwise, because this is too general, let us have a benchmark. And my benchmark in my writings is, let us agree that there are set of values that we call them values of modernity, like pluralism, acceptance of the other, relativity, women rights, human rights, the role of critical mind, and, and let us go and discuss with the Muslim brothers, and we will have their own definition for each one of them. They say, yes, we accept pluralism, but, for instance, can I, as a Muslim, become a Christian? No. So why, why, why you talk about, you say, I, I accept pluralism, you don't accept pluralism. You, you claim that you accept that pluralism is a main feature of life, but you have your own definition of pluralism, of acceptance of the other, of relativity, of critical mind. I mean, they, why they cancel in all Arab countries that are ruled by Islamist governments teaching uh, the theory of evolution, because for them it's a direct clash with religion. The West managed to find the outcome and, and, and create a truce between science and, and, and religion. But Muslims didn't do that, because Muslims didn't go through what Europe went through, which is a battle that made religion a religion and set of values, but not a code to govern society. Yeah, with, with the uh, kind of Reformation, I have to make a statement that as a, as a channel, we definitely believe in creation rather than uh, evolution. But that's for another program, I think, Tariq. I uh, just want to bring you back. How is ordinary life of ordinary Egyptians um, like now since the uh, Muslim Brotherhood have been in power for over a year? The, the masses that, in, that in had many people hoping the Muslim Brother might do a good job are now anti-Muslim Brothers. The, the, the support to Morsi is much lesser than a year ago. And if he won by 51% a year ago, today, unless the elections are falsified, I don't think he would have 30%. And uh, we've got a news clip to go to now that uh, looks at the growing protests and unrest in Egypt against uh, President Morsi's uh, leadership as president of Egypt. Anti-government protesters have been hitting the streets of Cairo, collecting signatures for a petition calling for the removal of Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi. They hope to collect 15 million signatures, and their plan is to stage a massive protest outside Morsi's Cairo Palace to highlight what they say are his failures to provide security and prosperity. That's a very civilized way in uh, delivering a message to President Morsi and to the Muslim Brotherhood group that they have failed in running this country. I tremendously understand the importance of holding elections once every four years, but after a great revolution like the one we had more than two years, two years ago, I don't think that this country can take three more years of failure, three more, more years of lack of security, three more years of a failed economy and a state of division and polarization that's caused by the policies of President Mohamed Morsi. Activists hope that the signature campaign can show the strength of anti-Morsi sentiment among the large sections of the public that have largely given up on politics since the popular overthrow of former dictator Hosni Mubarak in 2011. It is really a grassroots movement run by young people. 
young people who feel that they were betrayed, that their revolution was hijacked by non-revolutionaries, mainly by the Muslim Brothers, and they're trying to get it back. So to defy defiance or rebelling against the Muslim Brother is really the essence of that movement. There have been sporadic protests against President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood since taking office, but demonstrations have often been suppressed by the security services. The United States has largely refrained from criticizing President Morsi and continues to provide hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid to the strategically vital nation. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East report. Um, Tariq, uh, also what's also happening is is not only uh, secular and liberals and, and, and students who really had great hope in the revolution that saw the downfall of President Mubarak, that uh, Egypt would enter into a new dawn, a new era of democracy and freedom. Um, but we've heard um, so many reports from the Coptic Christian community in Egypt that um, under President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, they faced increasing persecution and actually fear for their own safety. What is the government of President Morsi doing to protect uh, religious rights, particularly those of the Christians, which is of grave concern to us here in Britain and the West? Doing very little, maybe the opposite, yeah? The whole issue of Christians in the Middle East is a very complicated issue. Number of Christians in Iraq is declining, in the Palestinian territories also declining in Jordan. In Lebanon, the Christians who used to be 40% of the population are now less than 20%. In Egypt, it is much complicated because 10 to 50 million Christians will not immigrate. I mean, you can, you can talk about immigration of hundreds of thousands, but not a large number as, I guess, they are above 12 to 15. If, even the numbers are not available because the government hides the numbers. Why they hide the numbers? Because they want to say they are not significant. They are a small portion of the society. If you talk about 15 million, you are talking about a huge portion of the society. And the government keeps talking about 6 million people. I was on TV a few weeks ago in Egypt and I talked about 15 million. I was called by the man in charge of statistics and said to me, please don't refer to 15 million. There are only 6 million. I said, it just cannot be the case. They were 2 million people in 1950 when our population was 19 million. So if we became 100 million, I mean, the 2 million must be today somewhere between 12 and 60 million. Also, the statistics of many embassies in Egypt talk about something like 15 million. So. If I'm a cop today, with the widely spread Islamic slogans, with the new breed of ministers and governors who all come from the Muslim Brotherhood organization, I should be very worried about myself. Number one, my chances in the society are less, and the pressure, cultural pressure, is more and more. So take a very simple thing, like in the Easter, the president did not uh, congratulate the Christians. And the rumor was that while he would do this for the Christmas, because he accepts that Jesus was born, he wouldn't go on the, on the Easter to congratulate them because he denies the whole story of the cross and the elevation of, of Jesus Christ. So if somebody is of this mentality, eh, he will not be fair to people. Christians were also uh, massacred during the revolution by the army in a much larger portion than the rest of the society. So in general, I, I claim, and I think I'm, I'm correct, that Christians from Morocco, very, very few Christians in Morocco, but Christians from Morocco to Bangladesh are under pressure, lots of pressure. And talking about them as first-class citizens is incorrect. They are not first-class citizens anymore. They used to be in the past of Egypt, but not anymore uh, today in 2013. Uh, which, which is really sad. And the other issue I really want to um, raise now is the fact that tourism has uh, incredibly suffered in Egypt. And according to today's uh, uh, Daily Mail, um, if I just get my notes here, something like um, a third of Egypt's revenue um, 
a third of Egypt, sorry, a third of Egypt's revenue is raised by tourism. And uh, now they fear that uh, Egypt ha is at a loss of for something like $2.5 billion. Um, why do you feel that so many Western tourists now are no longer visiting uh, Egypt and particularly the, uh, the pyramids? Egypt has two types of tourism. The history related tourism and the sun and beach related tourism. I would imagine 20% go to Luxor and to the temples and to the Egyptian museum, but the great part, 70 to 80%, go to Sharm el-Sheikh and Gona and, and, and Horgada. Both domains have problems. One of them is women, one, and the other one is uh, the ancient Egyptian art. The typical Muslim brother looks at the ancient Egyptians as the enemies of God because the story in the Quran is similar to the Bible. But we have nothing to do with, with this issue now. Yeah? We are talking about temples and statutes and, and history. There are claims among the Muslim brothers to destroy the statutes of ancient Egypt, as what happened in Afghanistan when they destroyed by tanks the statutes of Buddha a few years ago, just before 2011. I think it's like six months before 2011 when they got the tanks and they bombed the, the two statutes. So this is with regard, how would you go to Upper Egypt when you hear that many Egyptians are against these places and they believe they should be destroyed? And one of the leaders said on Egyptian TV that even Sphinx should be removed. The other one is the, the key, key word is women. How would women from Europe and America go to the beaches with all of this blah blah about women and the way she should be dressed and 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 so you have a problem in the two areas and at the end numbers speak clearly you said there is a significant drop of more than or slightly less than three billion dollars three billion dollars for egypt are very important they are uh, double the american aid and they are like the income of the Suez canal yeah. mm. i also want to talk to you about aid because uh, there's been a, a, a recent report here um, uh, that says that um, the headline that uh, 500 million uh, pounds of EU mon taxpayers money and around 70 million pounds from Britain that was donated to Egypt in aid has vanished according to an audit report and that the Muslim government has failed to protect human rights and that of ordinary Egyptians. What do you make of uh, this report? I, I think it is, uh, I love my country, but it's objectively a step in the right direction. How would you help a government that s walks on human rights, yeah? human rights being uh, human right, general human rights, women rights, Christian rights. Uh, it is a natural result and it tells that Europe sees more than what the USA does see. Because in this respect, Europe is way ahead. And I hate to say this, Russia sees more than both of them. Hmm. Why? Because Russia was hit in, in Shishnia. And because Putin was the prime minister when the, the the, the Qaeda people in Chechnya wanted to have independence and he is the one who handled them. And that's why today he knows exactly what could happen in Syria if the regime, the regime that is not good, but still if this regime falls, we might have a, a true Afghanistan in Syria much faster than what is happening in Egypt. Uh, I mean, surely the um, the West is in a great position. I mean, um, the EU gives, uh, as I've just quoted, uh, 500 million pounds of uh, European taxpayers' money in aid to uh, Egypt, which according to this report has been uh, used on corruption. So that money has just completely vanished. And that's uh, 70 million pounds of British taxpayers' money. Uh, combined with this, that the new Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, has uh, given the uh, Egyptian President, uh, President Morsi, 250 million pounds of uh, aid package as a reward for the so-called political reforms going on in Egypt. And uh, together with the $1.3 billion that America gives um, Egypt in the terms of uh, military aid and assistance, um, surely the West can actually use this as leverage to ensure that the Muslim Brotherhood actually um, protect uh, religious freedoms and protect the freedom of women and the freedom of rights and the freedom of democracy and freedom of press in Egypt and carries out democratic reforms. But clearly they're not doing this. Yes, but in different degrees. I, I believe that Europe with the UK have a much better 
uh, understanding to the situation than, than the USA. Uh, the USA, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many, many Egyptians, have betrayed the Egyptian uh, civil society advocates by siding with the Muslim Brothers without agreeing on these points. Mm -hmm. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, religious freedom. I mean, who can talk about religious freedom today in Egypt? I mean, it is it is it is not there. Yeah. So I I believe that the West needs to use these instruments wisely, and it is not being used wisely. Yeah, and isn't also isn't there a great danger now that uh, if America continues to uh, fund. Uh, uh, Egypt's uh, military project to the sum of something like 1.3 billion US dollars a year and that uh, the Egypt's relationship with Israel is incredibly fragile uh, and we could see the collapse of the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt in the near future that all the American money and hardware that they're giving now could be used in a future war against Israel in the future no doubt about it the one of the things that the Americans never understood is that the Muslim Brothers' view on Israel never changed. In, in May 1948, the first people to cross the borders of Egypt and the historic Palestine were the Muslim Brothers, who went to kill the newly born state. This view, we don't have any literature that suggests that they changed their views. Nothing. They are like many Palestinians who talk about 99 years truce. For me, as someone from the Middle East, I understand exactly the real intention of those who say we are very ready to accept 99-year truths. It means, let us wait and see, by time, maybe at after 99 years, we are in a position to do what we wanted always to do, which is one state. Not. I don't believe that many Arabs also believe in the two-state solution. I think that it's also a lip service more than a real conviction people because they know that in the short term they can't do much. They say, okay, we accept. But when you say, I accept two-state solution, you have to translate this into actions. Nothing translates this into action. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that's entitled Egyptian cleric, uh, that the Muslim uh, presidential candidate will liberate Jerusalem. رأينا حلم الخلافة الإسلامية حلم أرض الخلافة يتحقق بإذن الله على يد الدكتور محمد مرسي ومن معه من إخوانه وجماعته وحزبه رأينا الحلم الكبير الذي نحلم به جميعا الولايات المتحدة العربية الولايات المتحدة العربية ستعود إن شاء الله ستعود الولايات المتحدة العربية على يد هذا الرجل ومن معه إن شاء الله ستكون عاصمة الخلافة ستكون عاصمة الولايات المتحدة العربية هي القدس إن شاء الله بكرة مرسي حرر غزة أنا مصري بكل عزة بكرة مرسي حرر غزة بكرة مرسي حرر غزة بكرة مرسي حرر غزة بكرة مرسي حرر غزة ستكون عاصمتنا ليست القاهرة ولا مكة ولا المدينة وإنما القدس إن شاء الله وسيكون هتافنا على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين شهداء بالملايين على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين على القدس من عيون كل الياهو الطيار النعاس يلا يا عشاق الشهداء كلكم حماس من عيون كل الياهو 
يلا يا عشاق الشهداء كلكم حماس من عيون كل اليهود طيار النعاس يلا يا عشاق الشهداء كلكم حماس انسوا العالم كل العالم وانسوا المؤتمرات شيلوا سلاحكم صلوا قيامكم شيلوا سلاحكم صلوا قيامكم وادعوا رب الناس وادعوا رب الناس من عيون كل اليهود يلا يلا يا عشاق الشهداء من عيون كل اليهود طيار النعاس يلا يا عشاق الشهداء نعم كل عشاق الشهاده هم حماس وانا اقولها من هنا من المحله من قلب الدلتا من قلب مصر وليسمع العالم جميعا ولن نوري ولن نواري ولن نداهن نعم هدفنا القدس سنصلي في القدس او ننال الشهاده على اعتاب القدس الله على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين Welcome back to the uh, Middle East report. From that uh, clip uh, was was very scary, and I've shown it uh, a few times before on the uh, Middle East report. But it certainly reminds us of the uh, Nuremberg rallies that Nazis held in the 1930s. And uh, if that is not a wake-up call, uh, it should be because we are living in dangerous and precarious times, and it's time that we really begin to wake up to realize the threat that is emerging from the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which will not only threaten Israel, but it will also threaten our security here in Britain and Europe. Um, Tariq, what is your response to that uh, clip that you've seen? And um, thanks to memory, we have actually have it, which really does show the true ideology and the focus and the attentions of the Muslim Brotherhood. A clip as such supports me personally, because I keep saying and writing that the Muslim Brothers never changed their views on a wide number of points. Uh, things like uh, uh, peace, like others, like Christians, like women, like the world, like uh, religious freedom, like freedom of speech. And a clip like this comes to support what I am writing and saying, because somebody would embark on a discussion with me, prove that they didn't change. Here is the evidence. Here is the proof. The president of Egypt was sitting among the audience and he was listening to these things and he did not stop it to the country. He, he, have, he must have liked it because he stayed there and the man continued and the masses were repeating what proves that I am not exaggerating in saying the world is in danger. It is so hazardous. It threatens the march of civilization. We are not against Islam. We are against those who use Islam to play these games. Islam is a religion, and we agreed like five, six centuries ago that religions are personal matters. We believe that they are, when I say personal matters, I believe that we don't let societies manage by clergy. Societies are managed by science, by modern management techniques. But meanwhile, we respect religions. We respect the right of people to believe in whatever they choose. But this is not religious. This, these are sheer politics. What we have heard here, 100 percent politics. If somebody says this is religion or religious, I say, no, no, no. This is using religion to serve political aims. But it is all political. And uh, I'd love your views. We've got another clip to go to now, um, Tariq. Uh, your views on President Morsi. And uh, this is clip is uh, President Morsi talking before he was uh, president in 2010, calling upon um, to install hatred uh, on the Egyptian children towards Israel and the Jewish people. Let us go. 
يستطيع ان يلهن منها ان صدق وهو غير صادق لا يستطيع ان يلهن منها حرفا واحدا. يجب ان لا ننسى ايها الاخوه ونرجع ابنائنا واحفادنا كراهيه لهؤلاء للصهاينة لليهود لمن يسير الامور ولكنهم يجب ان يرضعوا الكراهيه يجب ان تستمر الكراهيه Tariq, uh, we saw in that clip there, really, uh, President Morsi expressing his views and opinions on Israel and the Jewish people and uh, calling upon the Egyptian children to hate Israel and the Jewish people. Um, isn't this the heart of the problem? Um, and, you know, we, we've seen what hatred does, particularly with the rise of the Nazi party in Germany and where that can lead to. So surely for the sake of humanity, for the sake of peace and security in the Middle East, the West really needs to wake up to the danger posed by President Morsi and the Muslim I don't need to comment on what he said, because he said it all. He said it in a way that I, I cannot say anything more about it. He talked about having hatred through breastfeeding to children. But I would say one thing in addition to this. This is not his own personal views. These are the views of all the Islamists in the world, not all the Muslims. All the Islamists, there are very modest Muslims who totally reject such a logic. But Islamists from Al-Qaeda to the Muslim brothers believe in this. This is not his own view. These are the views of an organization. And if somebody says it is Morsi's views, I say no, there is nothing as such in the Muslim brothers. In the Muslim brothers, the, the, they said that the whole culture of the Muslim brothers is based on obedience. The whole idea of having your own personal initiative doesn't exist. They, they base their education on obedience. This man was expressing the views of all the Islamists from the Far East to the Far West. Uh, which also leads us on to the very, very fragile relationship that Israel has with Egypt. I mean, historically, we saw back in 1979, um, President Carter oversee the uh, peace treaty between um, Egypt and Israel, in which Mitchin Begin and uh, President Antoine Sadat signed that historic peace agreement, which has lasted really until now. But that peace process now is looking increasingly, increasingly difficult. Um, and particularly now that the Israelis have decided to build up a security fence, that Israel's border with uh, Egypt has been a very, very quiet border. Now it's becoming very, very dangerous because we see the Sinai is becoming an area in which we're seeing increasing terrorist attacks from Israel. Do you believe under the leadership of President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood that Israel's historic relationship with Egypt is about to end? This is one of the topics that I disagree with many of my Israeli friends about. I say that ultimately you will have nothing from the Muslim Brotherhood but hatred and war. Nothing but hatred and war. And I believe that Israelis should not be happy with the short-term arrangement because there are some short-term arrangements between Hamas and Israel with the, the sponsoring of Mohammed Morsi. Don't be happy with the short-term arrangements and forget the long-term. In the long-term, these people have two things for you and not, nothing more, hatred and war. And I believe that the future will not be that uh, much for the peace agreement. I think the peace agreement of Anwar Sadat is a, could be in jeopardy very soon. But I'm not sure that the Muslim brothers will remain in power in Egypt for long. So I am worried as long as they are there, but I'm not sure that they will be there for a long while. They, they fail, their economic failure will enhance their political end. Interesting. Mm. And if we look at the, the wider Middle East and how the wider Middle East is playing out, particularly the uh, foreign policy of uh, President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, just only recently the, um, the Egyptian government and uh, the clerics of the Muslim Brotherhood are actually calling upon a jihad against the regime in Syria, against President Bashar al-Assad and uh, their supporters, which means Iran. So what is this? Are we seeing the emergence of a struggle and a battle for the control and identity of the Arab world between the um, Sunni Muslim brother interpretation of Islam 
and Iran's Shia Islamic crescent? This is an extremely important question because without modern states in the Middle East, this, this will be the path. It is either you have modern states and they exist next to each other, or if you don't have, if you have a, a theocratic regimes, this will be the path. All the Shia together fighting all the, the Sunni. And look at the situation in Syria. It, it demonstrates this patently clear. Hezbollah is with al-Assad regime because both they are Shia, Iran supporting them. Even Iraq, because of the prime minister, is under the control, relative control of Tehran. While Qatar and Saudi Arabia, both are supporting the Sunni Muslims. So the salvation is in new civil modern governments. Without modern governments, there, this will be the path as a large civil war between the Sunni and the Shiite Muslims that will burn the Middle East area and will have an impact on, on the free world in, in general. So how do we respond to this? How does the West respond to this? Because we, um, I mean, I, I do a lot of work in, in Europe and the, the view within Brussels and that of the European Union is that we can deal with the likes of uh, the Egyptian government. We can deal with President Morsi. We're willing to give him 500 million pounds of uh, European taxpayers' money. 70 million of uh, British taxpayers' money um, because he's democratic. Because he was democratically elected, it means that uh, Egypt now is a responsible government. Um, but surely what it means is that you can have multi-party elections, but doesn't mean you're a democracy, because if you're a democracy, you have to have the instruments of democracy and the institutions of democracy, such as freedom of press, freedom of religion, um, the protection of women's rights, etc. And uh, we're not seeing this. So why is Europe really not seeing the danger of what's happening and taking place in Egypt, which could have serious repercussions for the uh, Middle East as a whole? If we imagine ourselves now in the time machine of Wells and we go back to 1935 in Germany, three years after Hitler came to power, would you tell me that this man is democratic because he came via free elections? He came as a result of free elections. So free elections might bring to you a devil. And it did. 57 million people were killed because a man came to power democratically in Germany in the year 32 and 33. So let's finish with this. The ballot box is part of democracy, but it's not all democracy. And it is not democ democratic that you come to power and then radicalize your country from A to Z, which is happening now in Egypt. This is again is democracy as well. So I believe the West, let us, let us take what you said, but from a Syrian perspective. The West will have to make certain choices now with regard to Syria. The Syrian Bashar regime is outdated. There is no doubt about it. Far from ideal. But the alternative should not be Al-Qaeda regime. And it could be. So if the West and the USA cannot make certain that the new regime will not be a replica of Al-Qaeda because all, most of the fighters are Al-Qaeda fighters. If you decide to arm them and you don't know who you are arming and you end up with somebody like Osama bin Laden, but a younger Osama bin Laden heading Syria, it's your mistake. You made the wrong decision of standing neutral for a long while, two years, and now you say, I will arm them. Whom are you going to arm? This is your question. And if you don't answer it appropriately and wisely, you will pay a price. Do you go and, as a West, do you go and kill the same kind of people in Mali and Nigeria and support them to come to power in Syria? Is this is rational? Is this is logical? They are the same people. You could end up in Syria with people like the people that France was fighting in Mali. And I, have, I, I think France was doing a very good job. OK, I think we're down to the uh, final two minutes of the programme, Heggy. So very quickly, in, in a minute, um, can uh, secular reformers um, and uh, those for democracy and opponents of President Morsi in Egypt look to Turkey's examples with the um, 
protests and the uprisings that are going on in Turkey as an inspiration if things get really bad in Egypt? We look at Turkey, but Turkey of uh, Ataturk, not Turkey of Erdogan. Our, our, our role model is Kamal Ataturk, not Erdogan, who, who is reversing the wheel that uh, was moved by Kamal Ataturk in 1923 and built a modern Turkey. Turkey was considered by the Americans to be the model for all the Muslims. But look at the, look at the dictator who, who nearly runs all the newspapers by himself. Yeah. Which, which is also very troubling. So what does the future hold for, for Egypt? I personally believe, and I, I hate it, but I, I accept it. It's good that we had the Muslim brothers running Egypt. Without this, they would have been the dream of many people. It is a historic imperative step. These people represent a great portion of the culture of the area. Let them come and fail, and let us build a civil Egypt without anybody looking backward and saying the Muslim brothers could have been a good political power. They are a very dangerous political power. Uh, Tariqa, I want to thank you so much for joining me on today's uh, Middle East Report. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for giving you. me the chance to be with you. Pleasure. And uh, I want to thank you all for watching today's uh, Middle East Report, where we focused on Egypt and uh, particularly assessing uh, the uh, presidency of the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, uh, President uh, Mohamed Morsi. Um, we have to learn the lessons by history, and uh, if we don't fail to repeat them, that's why we have to really support brave and courageous men like Tariq Kegi, who is one of the leading um, Egyptians who are fighting for freedom and true democracy and modernization in Egypt, which will protect uh, Coptic Christians, will protect Israel's relationship with Egypt, and could actually bring about a new dawn and era in the Middle East if we see more men of his nature. And uh, we've got a song to leave you with, which very much reflects the attitudes of young uh, Egyptians growing up in Egypt, concerned about the state of politics in their country. So thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report.
This edition of the uh, Middle East Report with uh, Tariq uh, Hege was uh, filmed last week and uh, since then we've seen dramatic and uh, incredible historical events as the military junta in Egypt have uh, deposed uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, President uh, Morsi from power and also held many members of the Muslim Brotherhood under house arrest. So it's only a question of time to really understand uh, what is going on in Egypt and how this will all play out. And uh, thank you for watching today's Middle East Report.